What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Brody here, and I'm finally not alone today. I have a guest on, uh, my man Jeremy on the show. Jeremy, thanks for coming on today. And also, uh, how are you doing, my man? I'm good, man. Like I said, I just uh, got off work. I'm over here on the, the West Coast time. Um, had to run an errand, get back. So moving quickly, trying to get here on time. But uh, yeah, excited to talk about this. Uh, you know, this Bills jet depth chart going into the first preseason game, and uh, yeah, talk about some Bills as usual. Definitely, absolutely, and uh, yeah, it's definitely good to have someone back on here. I've been going solo the last uh, two weeks because oh, Ryan's man. been on a, on a vacation, you know. But hey, yeah. he's now uh, an engaged man, as he you know posted on Twitter. So definitely. That's true. Uh, Congratulations, Ryan! If you're listening, we're you know very happy for you, my friend, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you soon. But uh, Jeremy, I guess we'll get right into it because the Bills they dropped a depth chart, unofficial depth chart, mind you, uh, going into this preseason game against the Detroit Lions. I guess I'll start just overall. There is there anything on here that surprises you, or so far is this kind of what you expected from this kind of initial uh, depth chart here? Um, well, let me get it up. Sorry about that. Um, so. Going through it, I mean, uh, wide receiver doesn't, doesn't surprise me. We see, I see Cole Beasley, Stephon Diggs, Emmanuel Sanders. Uh, second, we have Gabriel Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, and Jake Kumaro, who I feel like we kind of have to talk about. Um, he, he has been a name that we're seeing a lot mentioned in training camp. And I'm just curious uh, with you, like how surprised were you to hear his name coming up and about like just how good he's been doing? I guess I was surprised. I mean, going into this offseason, I don't know about you, Jeremy, but I certainly thought that he was an afterthought to make the roster. I didn't think he really had much of a chance. I mean, I knew he was a good special teamer. I knew that Rogers, uh, Aaron Rodgers was particularly upset when the Packers got rid of him. Uh, but I didn't think that he'd have the training camp that we've heard he's had. I mean, of course, you know, we'll see him uh, tomorrow night. We're recording this Thursday. So I'm, I am excited to see him, but I, I've been a little surprised, you know, and I think the fact that this is a guy that we know can contribute on special teams is also making plays. I mean, his chances to make this roster, you have to think, are looking pretty good right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, special teamers, like, you know that that's just something that keeps Sean McDermott up at night. He loves him. Um, and when you mentioned him as an afterthought, uh, like, I agree because, you know, he made the 53 last year and... I don't know if it was, I don't I guess he did make the 53. I was trying to wonder if he was a 53 or if he just got called up, but I think he did get, he made the 53 temporarily. Um, he got one target, one reception. It was like a 22 yard touchdown. And then what happens? They're like, thanks. We'll talk to you later. Bye. And he gets released. So for me, like I, I always try and just look at things. Um, I, I always base like my thoughts on just what I have seen Sean McDermott and Brandon being do. I said, he was on the team. He got one catch. It was a touchdown. And then they said, thank you for your service. Good luck. And that was it. So for me, I just thought, I feel like they've seen what they've seen with them. Yeah. I, I just didn't really think he would uh, like kind of fire up like he's been doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree. And I, again, I, I, he did play in six games for the bills last year, if I'm not mistaken. And he played quite a bit of special teams for him during that stretch. But I believe that touchdown was his only target. He yeah. had the entire season with the bills. So, I mean, I agree with you. I did kind of think he was a camp body going into to this training camp. I thought that they're a guy like, you know, Marquez Stevenson, who maybe we'll talk about a little bit here. And Isaiah Hodgins would be clearly above him. But as things have kind of broken down and as we kind of see, I feel like a lot with training camp is that when some guys get hurt, you know, Emmanuel Sanders had the foot. Uh, we've seen Stefan digs out with the knee. It's a lot of opportunities for some of these other guys uh, to get some looks with the first team offense and Josh Allen and Kumbro has just taken advantage of this opportunity to the fullest uh, as of late. Yeah. I want to say uh, uh, Jake Kumbro, he pulled a, a Deion Dawkins last year. Like I said, one target, one reception touchdown, never right. see him as a receiver again. Um, and, and I'm a little bummed that he's doing so well because it, it looks like it's him against Isaiah Hodgins. And I really want to see it, Isaiah Hodgins. Um, I'm glad that we get a preseason this year. We get to see him. Um, I think Bean really wants to see Isaiah Hodgins. I think if uh, maybe it's a hot take, but I think if Isaiah Hodgins just looks decent at least, I think they might give him the spot over Kumaro because, like like you said, he's kind of an afterthought. Um, I, I don't. Bean mentioned how he really wants to see Jake Fromm play in an NFL game. That's why he drafted him. I feel like he's got to feel the same about Isaiah Hodgins. Like when you go back and you look at his red zone statistics from college. 
I, I just, I want to see him play. So um, I know we still got the rest of training camp to go. I'm not going to right now say that, oh, if, if Hodgins looks decent, he gets it over Kumro. But I just think Hodgins has more intrigue because he's, he's an unknown and just what he did in college. No, absolutely. I mean, this was a guy when, um, I think people are forgetting when, when the Bills drafted him, a lot of people were saying that they thought he was going to have more of an impact and have more production as a rookie than Gabriel Davis. I mean, people mm-hmm. were really, really high on Isaiah Hodgins when the Bills got him, thought he was a total steal. And I still am intrigued by him. I mean, he's a guy that's obviously has a ton of length, which I think this receiving core is certainly lacking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's a big guy, six, four, six, five, and a good route runner too. I mean, that's something that's been documented back to his days at Oregon state. And I know I've been reading up a little bit in training camp. He's, He's been getting open, you know, really creating a lot of separation, which, you know, Brian Dable, Sean McDermott, they really like that from the receivers. So yeah. I, I I think the big thing with Hodgins, if he can show some value as a special teamer, I think he does have a good chance to possibly make this roster and really push Jake Kumro. If he can't really provide any special teams, because I think people kind of forget is that these kind of bottom of the roster you know, like your wide receiver six, right? That's a guy you need to rely on to play special teams. They're probably not going to get a lot of targets. At least they shouldn't unless, you know, there's injury or whatnot. So I think that if Hodgins can show that he has value as a special team, uh, as a member of the special teams, I think that he does have a legit case to be made to make this 53-man roster. Yeah. Um, that's kind of all I have to say about the Kumro versus Hodgins. Um, are you good? Yeah, no, no. I'm, that's I think we've covered it pretty pretty well. Cool, because I think the the rest of the wide receivers I want to talk about. Um, Duke Williams. I, I posted this on Twitter not too while ago. I said Gabe Davis is what we wanted Duke Williams to be. Williams is. I'm sorry, he's redundant at this point. Love the story, but like you said, he's also I think another afterthought. Um, Tanner Gentry. Hey, maybe we'll see you on the practice squad. Uh, but the last thing that sticks out about these wide receivers is uh, Marquez Stevenson looks like somebody mentioned he's on the bottom. Um, I, I think he already had an uphill battle because we have Isaiah McKenzie who's got experience and can handle both kick and punt returns. And with Marquez Stevenson, I, I just wonder like how quick is he going to be able to learn what he, he can do kick returns? I was like, how quick is he going to be able to pick up punt return duties as well and then do them better than Isaiah McKenzie? So that's kind of my thought there. How about you? Yeah, I think um, I, I think we had heard that Stevenson was coming along pretty slowly. I was kind of shocked how far down the depth chart he is. I mean, I understand he's a rookie, and McDermott's all about kind of bringing them along slowly, letting them kind of earn it, having vets ahead of them. But, I mean, he as of right now, and again, this is an unofficial depth chart, but, I mean, he's fourth-team offense right now. I mean, he's really at the bottom of this roster, which is a little surprising. And I think that... You're right. He definitely had an uphill battle. I think him beating out Isaiah McKenzie, sorry, Ryan, but that, that was just going to be kind of a long shot, I think, because they value having the veterans and McKenzie such a proven player up to this point. Uh, I do wonder at this point, I think that Stevenson is probably destined for the practice squad. I don't know if you agree, Jeremy, but I, I just I do. don't see how he can possibly make the roster as of right now, unless he has an amazing preseason, which we've seen crazy things happen before. And, this is a guy that was an amazing kick returner in college. So, you, you know, he breaks out a couple of returns. You never know. But as of right now, he's what wide receiver nine, wide receiver 10. I mean, that is just such a far way to come to go all the way there to making this roster. Yeah. And I got to say, you know, going back, I think one of the last writer rooms, uh, writers rooms I did, like Ryan was on it. Um, I think I'm kind of on the same side with Ryan when it comes to Isaiah McKenzie, but it's kind of just like uh, I, somebody posted something and was like, is he the best on this team or just like the best we have? That's kind of the same thing, actually. I don't, I messed up the question. Um, I, I think the the return duties were maybe kind of mishandled by McBean or maybe they just think Isaiah Mc, McKenzie can take over. Um, like I said, he's got the experience. He can do both. It would look bad if we turned around and we're giving up two roster spots to two returners. So I, that's that alone, I think gives like, I feel like uh, puts Isaiah McKenzie up front for the job. Because again, if you're Brandon Bean, John McDermott, and then all of a sudden you went from having a, a kick and punt returner, which is one position. And now you're splitting it up. That just looks bad. So that's another reason I feel like Isaiah McKenzie just is going to have the job. Right. I mean, it just seems like there's kind of no one else they can give it to at this point. I mean, that you know, I know some people wanted the Bills to get a uh, Cordero Patterson, who's a guy that is obviously one of the best returners in football. 
Um, but, you know, he signed elsewhere. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think having two players rostered to do, one do kick and one do punt is just kind of crazy, especially with a roster that is so competitive and be so hard to make and that has such high aspirations. I mean, we're talking about a team that is trying to win a Super Bowl. And I think to kind of waste roster spots on the return duty position is is a little bit much for, you know, again, a team that, you know, struggles to rush the passer and has all these defensive ends that are all vying for roster spots and roles on this defense. And to lose a spot on a guy that can make a real impact for someone who could just catch punts or kicks, I, I do agree with you. I think that the, the Bills are just in a position where they can't really afford to kind of waste roster spots and players like that yeah and that almost would be a good transition for the defensive end rooms because it's like there's people trying to make a state for having seven defensive ends but <laughs> we should probably stay on offense but um anyways yeah so i forgot there's another guy on here lance uh lenore lenoir i'm not exactly sure you say i think it. you're right i think i think it's lenore yeah and then there's brandon powell which again sorry i, I don't think they have a shot <laughs> right now, the only other guy I do want to quickly touch on here in the offense that kind of caught my eye, and this is someone that I know a lot of Bills fans have sort of been talking about, uh, is Jake Fromm. And mm-hmm. I know you did mention him earlier. Obviously, I think he's kind of a... a, a you're very, very divided, I think, the opinions on Jake Fromm. I think there are a lot of people who want to see what this guy can be and believe he could be the long-term backup in Buffalo. And there's also, I think, an equal amount of people who think he has no chance of really even making it in the NFL I, of course, we've never seen him play, so it's hard to kind of ask, you know, what do you expect from him? But, like, it, it, what do you think Jay Fromm could be? Like, do you expect him to maybe show out a little bit in this preseason, or do you think he's just totally... Because as of right now, he's behind Davis Webb, which is not a good sign, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they... Uh, I mean, I, I understood the the draft pick because I know some people had, like, uh, Fromm going, like, the third round. Brandon Bean got in the, in the fifth. When I saw that, I said, oh, wow, like, he was still there. Uh, okay, like, sure. Um, but he's very similar to Matt Barkley. I think, uh, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean for the longest time have been trying to find a backup similar to, to Josh Allen. Um, I think they tried it with, uh, Tyree Jackson. It didn't work out. I think they've been trying it with Davis Webb and they just haven't been able to get him on the roster. Um, at this point, I'm so over the front pick. I, (laughs) I I don't even want him to make it as QB three. Um, let him put, put him on the practice squad or, you know, let somebody else try. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm not interested in him being the long term because, again, it's just like Matt Barkley. When he comes in, it's like, oh, change the playbook because he's not going to be able to do this. So I'm actually a little excited that uh, Davis is a little ahead of him. I don't care if Fromm makes this team or not. Back to my uh, reference earlier when Brandon Bean said, oh, I just I really want to see Jake Fromm play an NFL game. At this point, I'm like, why? Like, <laughs> I, I, like come on. Like, you got to be over that by now. Like, let him go. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to see, um, Davis Webb up there and I'm glad that we have Mitchell Trubisky as our backup. I think he is probably one of the best backups in the league right now. And, uh, so I'm feeling pretty happy about that. Yeah. I, I kind of have been in a little bit of the camp of, you know, I don't really think Jake Fromm is anything to invest much in. I just think, you know, like you mentioned, he's just not at all like Josh Allen to the point where you got to change the playbook entirely becomes in. He's not mobile. He doesn't have a big arm. He's not a big guy. He just doesn't bring, I think a lot of NFL intangibles to the table that you need to have in order to hang in this league as a quarterback. And I think a lot of people have been looking at that. Trubisky is a, a one-year deal guy. He's not going to be on this roster next year and are freaking out that we need, well, what if we, you know, we need to make sure we have someone as their backup. But I, I think we also have to remember, like a lot of people were kind of upset when Matt Barkley got let go. Mm-hmm. And they let him walk, but the Bills signed Matt Barkley in the middle of the season. Like you can get decent enough backup quarterbacks, kind of any at any point in the year from anywhere, you know. And I think developing a backup, although it's nice and it's good to have a quality backup, like I, like you said, I'm happy that Trubisky is here as the backup because I I have faith in Trubisky. If he had to go play three, four, five games, that he could totally you know steer the ship in the right direction and keep everything on track. But I I just think that. Jake Fromm is just nothing to get worked up and excited about. And I think that when people are making an argument for him to make the the roster, just because he's a fifth round pick, first of all, they've never kept more than three quarterbacks normally. So I don't think he's making it just as as far as numbers go. And on top of that, again, I just don't see any reason for him to have a roster spot, especially now that COVID has kind of changed a little bit here in the NFL. 
They don't need that emergency quarterback. I, I just see no path and no reason really to have him along on the roster too. Yeah, and you mentioned people being upset about uh, Matt Barkley being released. And look, he came in in a, in a down year and uh, lit up the Jets, and that was fun. But he never did anything like that again. Um, the next time we saw him, I think he came in relief for the Patriots game. I don't think he looked great at all. He came in, he played week 16 or 17 against the Jets. They didn't look great that game at all. Um, And then he came in to just get sacked by Joey Bosa, I think, like the next year. Um, So yeah, like to be upset, like you could be upset because like, oh, he was just, he was a good guy to have on our team. It's, It's like a breakup that needs to happen. It's like you're sad because you like the person, but it has to happen. Um, so yeah, like I say, um, Jake Fromm, I'm over it. I, I don't care to see him on the 53 or taking up a spot. Yeah. And I'm I'm actually excited to see Davis Webb probably play tomorrow than, than Jake Fromm. No, I I actually think Davis Webb, I mean, he hasn't really played a lot at full action. I think, I don't know if he ever even has played in a game, honestly. I I really, I don't believe he has. Right. And, but from what I remember him coming out, I mean, he actually does have size mobility and like arm strength like he actually on paper i think has more going for him as a backup for josh allen than jake Fromm. so i'm also kind of excited to see him play um and it will be interesting to see i mean we're gonna see a lot of them because obviously i i gotta ask you this do you think josh allen plays a snap in the preseason um you know my dad and i were talking about this like just before i, I jumped on with you um with some of the injuries uh, you know, because I'm looking at this the depth chart, and I'm and I know Dawkins is down, but I see Spencer Brown is supposed to back him up. Um, I mean, I, I figure I've, you got to at least play some. Um, maybe Josh doesn't play this game. Maybe we wait until our the majority of our starters are a little more healthy, and you know, we wait until we're playing a team that we have a little bit of tape on. I mean, we're playing the Lions. They have a new head coach and Dan Campbell, who's a crazy son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> You know, he's probably got new coordinators. Like, we, we don't really know what to expect. So part of me is like, ah, maybe we don't play that many of our starters. Like, maybe we wait till, till next week. And we when we're playing a team that we can actually go back and watch their first preseason and get a little bit of an idea. So if they did that, I'd be okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I for one, I definitely don't want Josh Allen's kneecap to be a uh, bit off your week one of the preseason. So I, yeah. I'd, I'd rather not that. I, I think I personally don't really need to see Josh Allen play a preseason game. I think that... They're returning 10 out of their 11 starters, same offensive coordinator. And if, you know, I, 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 the only other guy that's obviously the new starter is Emmanuel Sanders, who's a seasoned vet. He's been in the mm-hmm. league for a decade at this point. He's played, you know, I have no worries that Sanders and Allen, like they're going to eventually, um, you know, have chemistry between one another. Yeah. I wonder I if, think, uh, if McDermott, w- is, if he like meets Dan Campbell before the game, if he's like, Dan, be honest, you don't have a lion anywhere, do you? <laughs> he's like, it's <laughs> like, no. He's like, look in my eye and tell me you do not have a lion in the stadium. He's like, mm. it's like that's it. Josh isn't playing, right? <laughs> and, and, but, you know, and, and honestly, as long as Deion Dawkins is out, don't play him either. I mean, are you really gonna play Josh Allen behind a rookie yeah. who has never played a snap in the NFL at left yeah. tackle? Like, I just think right now, sp- specifically for this game, I think they made the right decision not playing him. And honestly, I I personally wouldn't be that upset if they didn't play him for one preseason game this year yeah. at all. Yeah, and I, I think, he, but um, we would definitely see him like the second or third, which is fine. So, uh, and especially if if Bobby Hart is one of those tackles, <laughs> right? Then do not put forget him out it. Yeah, there forget it at all. All right, but so I think, but otherwise, I think outside of that, I think this, I think the offense right now, the depth chart, it's about what you would expect. I don't mm-hmm. think there's any really any other surprises. I think the defense, though. Specifically, the defensive line. This is, I think, going to be one of the more kind of hotly discussed and debated positions, if you will, mm-hmm. on this team. Because, A, the Bills have invested just so much into this defensive line with draft picks and money. And then, B, just the, the sheer numbers. I mean, there's, as you've talked about, you mentioned earlier, I mean, there are some people making a case for seven defensive ends to make this roster. Yeah. Like, I was asking a few weeks ago if, like, six was possible and now people are talking about seven i was like wow it's like i thought i was pushing it with six right it's seven <laughs> no i know and, and i guess that kind of like like do you what, what do you think i mean again it's it's tough to judge when we still have three whole you know preseason games left which means there's still you know a couple of weeks of training camp here like as far as numbers go i mean how many defensive ends do you realistically see the bills keeping 
Um, like I said, I've seen people trying to make a case for seven recently. I don't think I'd put any money on that. I would, uh, I mean, five, I think was like, is a little more than theirs, but because of the, I was asking about six because of the versatility of a lot of these guys. There's so many of these defensive ends who can kick inside. Um, I had thought maybe six was a possibility. And my reason is first off, I feel like Hughes and Addison, they're locks. Um, Epinesa, he's a lock. Um, spacing. Uh, we just drafted uh, Boogie and Rousseau. They're locked. That's five. That leaves Obata and um, Daryl Johnson. Honestly, I feel like that puts Obata like as the odd man looking out, but I really want to see him play too. Like he's the guy that I, you know, everyone's saying um, looks like his best football is ahead of him. So like that's, I, I don't want to see uh, us losing out on him. Um, so that's why I'm stuck at, I, I feel like six is <laughs> it's kind of a lot, but it's just because there's so many like I want to see on this team. No, I, I'm, I'm kind of in a similar place with you as far as like the numbers, just because I feel like they can't, as, they, as I've said, they've invested so much in defensive end. I think they have to keep at least six because whether it's Johnson or Abada, who are the odd man's out, neither of them are going to make it on the practice wall because those are good enough players. Yeah, that someone's going to you know c- try to try to swoop in and grab them yeah. on, on cut day. So I think, and I and I do agree with you. The fact that there's so much versatility there, I think, allows them to keep. Uh, a few extras because they can play inside and outside a lot of these guys. Now, what I do wonder is like, does that impact also the number of defensive tackles they want to keep? Cause normally they keep four, but I mean, are you really going to keep 10, 11 defensive linemen? Like that's just, you know, so many, I know I've seen some 53 man projections where people had the bills only keeping 3d tackles because they have so many, of these kind of hybrid inside out players like bogey and Obata. Do you think they do ultimately keep, you know, the, the typical four D tackles, or do you think they might try to go lighter at D tackle to make room for some of these defensive events? Yeah. I was thinking if they went with six, I, I proposed that too. I was like, do we just keep three? I think those three would easily be, there's Ed Oliver, Starler Tule for sure. Um, I, Vernon Butler had the contract restructure and I think his cap hit kind of seems like he's going to be on there and he can go back and forth. Uh, so I think that just comes down to, you know, are we cutting Justin Zimmer like and Harrison Phillips? I know we like like Justin Zimmer, um, but he kind of seems like a guy who has like a flash here and there. But when is he gonna like really kind of turn it on and like cement himself? Because I don't think he's exactly done that quite yet. Again, I know he's he's another guy who's got a good story. He's made a good like player too. Um, so yeah, three fe- three defensive tackles would be. Um, you're, you're not giving yourself a lot of like room for, for depth. If you go with just three though, as well, you know, if, if we go with three and that's star and Butler, who's like um, the three backup, three tech and backup one tech. I mean, if uh, Butler goes down, then you're all your defensive tap uh, tackle depth is gone. So right. that could be um, reckless. And I don't know if you want a defensive end, like constantly playing defensive tackle. Maybe it won't be a problem if we have six, so I, I don't know. That's something I would ask people smart to me. Like, has that been done before? Have you seen it before? I'm mm-hmm. curious. Right. It, it, it's definitely going to be fascinating how they kind of break down the numbers here just because there's so many. And, you know, I'm looking at the depth chart. And, and the, the one thing with these D tackles that I thought was pretty surprising was Vernon Butler over Harrison Phillips on that. Yeah. I mean, Harrison Phillips is pretty far down this depth chart. I mean, they have him right now all the way with the third strings. So like the D tackle he'd be lining up with is uh, Brandon Bryant, who I honestly don't know a thing about and can tell you who he is. So mm. like, I, I I think like, and I guess, you know, asking, I guess I'll ask you this question, Jeremy, like I, you know, mentioned Justin Zimmer, who's a guy I know fans really like, I, I can't lie. I am a little bit of a Zimmer guy. I, mm-hmm. I do kind of like some of the things he brings to the table. I mean, do you think Harrison Phillips is really on this like roster bubble? Cause this is a third round pick that before the ACL was looking really well and it was still kind of recovering and coming back from that last year. Like, do you think it's too early to give up on him and release him at this point in his career? Cause he's going only in his fourth year or is this a guy that realistically could get cut? Um, I wouldn't think of it as too early to move on from him. If he just does not look good at all in the preseason. Um, that's the thing. I feel like 
he 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 looked just like a player who was coming off of an ACL. Like people say, you know, you take yet you lose a season to an ACL, and it's like you kind of lose a little bit of the next season too. Um, and that and that show, like he didn't look great the first half. He was a healthy scratch for like a game or two. He started to look better in the second half, I believe. Um, I still don't remember hearing his name a whole lot. I'm not a guy who like goes back and watches film or anything, right. but. So I think he really has to show up in the preseason. If he is just not looking great in the preseason, then I think, yeah, I guess I wouldn't say, I'd say it's probably not too soon. Yeah. He might have to go, which sucks because he was like our um, Walter Payton man of the year. He does a lot of stuff for the community, but you know, wherever he goes, he'll be loved. Yeah. I, I, it's definitely too bad. And on top of that too, you know, th- he was being compared to Kyle Williams, you know, Kyle Williams 2.0, which obviously, I mean, cause they just looked alike, right? They, well, they looked like, I mean, they, they play a little, a, a little similarly, I suppose too, but right. But still though, I mean, I mean, anytime you get compared to Kyle Williams at all, especially with Buffalo, I mean, of course we'll gravitate towards a player and, you know, fans did gravitate towards him. So I, I would, I, I don't know what they're going to do. It, they definitely got a tough situation there. I think if, if Vernon Butler's contract was easier to get out of, I really think that he would probably be the, the, the odd man out here because mm-hmm. I just think, I mean, again, just like you, like I'm not someone who really grinds film necessarily. I'll try to like watch some of the you know film breakdowns and pretend I know what they're talking about half the time, uh, even though I don't. But, you know, from what I've heard, from what I've read, and from the little I guess I've seen, I mean, it, it does seem like Vernon Butler was generally just pretty underwhelming nothing really special, nothing there that was really, you know, kind of caught your eye. So I think if his contract was easier to get out of, I think there'd be a pretty good chance he'd be the one getting cut. But like you said, there's really no point in cutting him. You know, that contract's not so easy to get out of, especially with this restructure. So they might have no choice other than to keep Vernon Butler around. Yeah. And, and, you know, I kind of want to mention, I, I do kind of feel like the defensive tackle position, um, was kind of mishandled this off season. Um, our, we're putting all of our eggs in the starter two lay basket. And, and I know we're happy because we didn't have really a one tag last season and star isn't great. Like at this point, it's like he, at this point in his career, he was serviceable. Like you hear most people say, um, but that's, but that's kind of it. And uh, you know, Vernon Butler is kind of, it's like, is he a one tech? Is he three tech? Like, which one is he? Um, right. Harrison Phillips is supposed to be that one tech, but again, he's got to show up. So it's it's kind of unfortunate that we're looking at defensive tackles on the bubble, not because of better defensive tackles ne- uh, necessarily, but it's like, but we want to make a space for a defensive end. Um, so I do want to mention, do you, do you agree with that or? No, I, I actually do agree because I, I wanted the Bills this offseason. Now I know some people were having them, draft someone pretty high but i did want them to get basically just a big fat guy to clog up the middle like they don't mm-hmm. it seems like they're really lacking specifically a depth at that area and i like right like you said like st- like i think star is a decent player i think he mm-hmm. does he he's good at what he does but again this is a guy who didn't play last year right he mm-hmm. opted out and on top of that he is just getting generally older this is he's not a young guy anymore he's been in the league now for eight seasons so i, I agree and i think that my biggest problem i think with how Brandon Bean and the front office have handled the the defensive tackle position. I think they've invested a lot in like the undersized, super athletic D tackles, which I do think it's important to have, you know, like an Ed Oliver type. But, you know, last year, I mean, they were rolling out Ed Oliver, Quinn Jefferson as you're starting to tackle D tackles. You know, those are both guys under 300 pounds who win more with kind of quickness and, and, and agility. And, you know, was a big reason why I think the Bills struggled at times to stop the run last year because because they didn't have anyone that could really sort of clog things up down low. So I do agree. I think they have maybe. I mean, we'll see. Of course, how the season plays out. We could be eating these words, you know, in yeah. two three months. But oh uh, no, we hope we are right. <laughs> and of course, we hope we are. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't like questioning Brandon Bean because he's done so so many good things. Of course, but I do agree with you a little bit. I do. I would have liked them to have put a little bit more of a priority I think on finding really good quality depth at defensive tackle because right now it feels like you're kind of betting on a lot you know you're betting that star returns to how he was in 2018 and 19 and that Harrison Phillips bounces back from the ACL and that Vernon Butler plays like he did you know the year before the Bills signed it's just it's a lot of you know betting on possibilities rather than having real concrete like you know confidence in, in some of these guys do you think um, 
you know, if you're Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, if you're looking at the defensive end room right now, like everybody who's there, do you regret this? Do you think he regrets um, the Addison and Vernon Butler restructure? Because those restru- those restructures kind of made it hard to cut him this season, right? Yeah, I think yeah. Basically, I don't, I don't, I know, I haven't looked at the Vernon Butler's numbers yet, but I, I do know that it's impossible to get his deal. And then say, I know Addison, although it's basically the they would they would save essentially no money. I think that the dead cap is just it, it's it's basically eight million a cap room, but his dead cap's also eight. Million. It's something like that. So there's no point in releasing him either. I mean, I think Addison no, because what we've seen is that he's really been sort of that mentor for uh, Boogie, Rousseau, Epinesa. So I do think they really value him as a mentor. And I do think that they want to use him more as a sort of situational pass rusher where he can be a little bit fresher and, and get him off the field in rundowns because he's not a good run defender. I think we kind of saw that last year. He really struggled against the run. Vernon Butler, they might be. Because Vernon Butler was came off a nice year the year before they signed him i think he had like six sacks which is pretty yeah. good from it from from a one tackle that's pretty pretty darn good production as a pass rusher but other than that his career he's been pretty darn disappointing from for, for a guy who's a former first round pick and they paid him decent money i mean they didn't pay him nothing i think it was two years i want to say like 16 million or something like that initially was that contract and so that that's some for real money to be paying a, a, a defensive lineman so I think they maybe regret making that deal in the first place, but clearly they did want to keep him around. I mean, they they, they do have the Carolina connection with Eric Washington uh, and company, so I think maybe they regret that deal. But I don't think they really wanted to get rid of him, though. Like going into this off season. Yeah, yeah, I agree for sure. And I think also another thing I do want to point out. And then we can kind of get into sort of the other topic we want to talk about, which is some of these sort of, you know, fan favorite training camp darlings. But what are your thoughts on uh, the Bills, their depth chart? I don't know if you noticed this, but they only have uh, two starting linebackers, the nickel as a starter. There's no like third linebacker as a starter. They just leave yeah, it as no, like nickel defense. There's no like a like strong side, right? Where AJ Klein should be. They have him as a like Matt Milano's backup. Right. Yeah. I think I, I yeah. thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I noticed that too. We were talking and I was like, oh, AJ Klein is uh, Matt Milano's backup now. I mean, that's kind of what it was last year, like unintentionally. Um, so yeah, interesting uh, choice to make for sure. <laughs> I didn't notice right. it. Definitely just kind of, I feel like, uh, just sort of admitting like, because they're in the nickel all the time that like, I mean, come on, like these are really the starters. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, but let's get into this conversation because initially this is what we were going to kind of talk about um, last week which is sort of some of these training camp darlings, as I kind of call them, which are the guys, you know, that the fans really fall for are all about. They kind of long shots to make the roster. Um, every year there's guys, I mean, you know, from Des Lewis and Brandon Riley and, you know, you, the list goes on. So I kind of want to, I guess, play a little game with you here, Jeremy. I want to give you some names. I want you to tell me whether or not you think they can make the 53-man roster. I'm going to go, I'm going to skip past guys that we already kind of discussed and if you do think they're making the roster, what you envision their role likely being for the Bills. Uh, so my first guy I'm going to ask you about is uh, Antonio Williams. What do you think about him? Can he make the roster? And if he does, where, where, where do you envision him as far as being, being a contributor or not on this team? Um, I think he can. Um, granted, we only have the second half of the Miami gang to go off of, but he won like a, like a special teams player award in college, I heard. Um we always love a running back on this roster who is like strictly special teams, but I mean, he showed he can do special teams and play if you need him to. So again, I don't know the specifics of special teams. Um, and I know a lot of people who, who watch the game a lot, but who also don't know it. Um, I don't know what Taiwan Jones does. And I don't know if Antonio Williams can do that, but it's definitely something I was like, can can we do this? Because again, he, like William showed us that he can be, a, a backup to the backup running back right. if needed and he can play special teams so again i wish i knew more about special teams and ha- how he can contribute but uh yeah i think he can okay so you if you were to make the roster you sort of envision maybe being kind of a primary special teams guy who could be like a very like again if there if if injury sort of be that kind of backup yeah he's player. the only one like i don't believe breda plays any special teams i know people might say like he's 
done some kick returns like three times, but I don't think that makes him a special teams guy. Um, so I think he'd be the guy dressing for sure to play that special teams position. Um, would he see any, uh, you know, offensive snaps? Maybe not a lot, but it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how this, uh, running back room shakes out. I mean, um, uh, motor versus Moss for one thing. And I, I just heard today that I guess Moss is dealing with a hamstring mm-hmm. thing, which, which sucks because I'm like, man, you, <laughs> I, I was telling my dad, I was like, he, I hope he doesn't get that, that label that nobody wants, you know, which is injury prone. Right. Um, so that would be a bummer. Um, so yeah, starting to go off, but yeah, can Antonio Williams make this team? Yes, it would probably, but he'd probably have to take that special team spot from Taiwan Jones. And again, I don't even know if they play the same t- special teams position. Right. I, I, I think that with Moss being out, I, although it does kind of you know suck because I did want to see Zach Moss. So many people are really excited about what he can do in year two, but we kind of talked about a little bit of Kumaro, you know, with injuries, but this has opened up the door potentially for An- Antonio Williams to get a lot of snaps this preseason because mm-hmm. he's going to be running probably with the twos in particular now. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how he looks in, in preseason as well. I, I think that he has a chance to make this team. I think if Matt Breida has a good preseason though, because I know I've, from what I've heard, it sounds like he's having a pretty good training camp. I think it makes it pretty, I don't want to say impossible, but pretty, pretty hard for Antonio Williams to make the roster because you know, that, Breed along with Motor and Moss, that's three plus Taiwan Jones, who, from what Sean McDermott has said about him, and it, it seems like they have no interest in getting rid of Taiwan Jones. So I think it's tough for Antonio Williams to make the roster, but if he outplays Breed up, you know, I think that's his avenue to get on this team is to basically beat up Breed up, but that might not be so easy. Well, I mean, they let Taiwan Jones walk the season before. I mean, he went on to uh, the Texans. I don't know if it was just outbid, but to me, as says, well, they, if they let him go before, I feel like they could do it again. Awesome. Um, so that's, I, I think it's possible. Like Taiwan Jones can go somewhere, but we'll see. We'll see. So I don't know if he's playing. I, I believe he's out because I, I think he's had an injury, but uh, <laughs> I got to ask you this. I'm, I, I'm curious, you know, this, this leads to like an eye roll or anything, but uh, Christian Wade. <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, we're, we're already talking about like these four guys, uh, you know, Moss, Motor, Brita, um, Antonio Williams having to take a spot from Taiwan Jones. That's five running backs right there. And like, I would love to see. I mean, preseason is probably where we will only see Christian Wade play again. Um, so, yeah, it, it is what it is. Like, it's another story that we like, but he's got a lot of competition. Right. Now, I, I, listen, Christian Wade. It's a great story, and I'm not gonna lie. Like the plays he made, two pre, I think it was 2019, I believe it was that you know that preseason when he made that had that long touchdown run against uh, in that first game and that great run after the catch uh, against the Panthers the other time, mm-hmm. like which also should have been a touchdown, but his which, rugby mindset kicked in. Right? Yeah, he didn't follow. He didn't follow his blocks. He didn't follow yeah. Duke to the end zone. But uh, no, Christian Wade. Like I, I, I said it after that preseason, like. There's no question as a physical athlete, like he is at the caliber of an NFL player, athletically speaking, like the speed, the power, the agility, the balance, like that is all at the level it needs to be in order to be an NFL player. But like, I think if this was a rebuilding football team, I think Christian Wade maybe would have a a shot. But again, as I kind of said earlier, we're talking about a team that has Super Bowl aspirations. So I just can't possibly envision them. Yeah, making a role and leading a spot for a guy that four years ago was not had never played football before. So I just don't think I know people love Christian Wade and he's such a cool story. I think there's a good chance he just gets that. Uh, what is it like? Like international player sort of like um, tag uh, or whatever. It, I, designation. I designation. Right. Where he just kind of doesn't count against the practice squad, but he's on there the whole year. I, I, I bet that's probably where he lines up when it's all said and done. I agree with everything so we kind of talked about a little earlier but i'll I'll bring him up just because you know you didn't we didn't really talk about whether we think he's making this team or not but how good of a chance do you think fa obata really has of making this roster because he's someone that is is pretty intriguing yeah like i said i i I really want him to but 
there's so many defensive ends that like we just have to keep. Like I said, Addison and Hughes. Like we have to keep them. Um Epinesa, I don't think they're going to try and move on from him like before his second year. Um, and then we just drafted two defensive ends. So those guys like automatically they go to the front of the line. Like it it just is what it is. So I really want him to. It, it seems tough. <laughs> like he might be a release and, and it's gonna be a bummer, but it's just because there's just so much. And then, you know, I thought Daryl Johnson was gonna be the guy looking out, but everyone's been talking about like just how good he is on special teams. And I know like there's a lot of like fans who want to just ignore the special team aspect, like, oh, who cares? Like they don't contribute on offense or defense or something. And I get that, but you, you just you gotta remind yourself like how much like that matters to you know probably most coaches but sean mcdermott in general so i think it's going to be tough because of how many players there are like we got the youth guys the younger guys ahead of them we got the veterans and their contracts ahead of them it's just uh it's unfortunate but i I just feel like it's on the back of the line and it is what it is right i actually like that you brought the special teams thing too because like you mentioned i mean mcdermott seems to be really invested in special teams uh We've seen it. They, they signed Tyler Matikiewicz to a pretty big contract, and he really only plays special teams mm-hmm. because they just they value that side of the ball. I guess that that phase really so great. And I think people are forgetting. And this I know this is kind of a while back, but like like Rex Ryan, right when he was the head coach of the Bills, like th- it seemed like the the value put in special teams was so low because I don't think people remember how horrific the Bills punt and kick coverage units were when Rex Ryan was the head coach of, of this team, like they were one of the worst special teams units in the league. And it, I mean, it, was, and it really did impact the game because I mean, field position is a huge deal and you can't be giving that up so easily. So I think Bam Johnson, I mean, it's, it's tough to, you know, to see what they're going to do with him mm-hmm. just because he's such a lopsided special teams player. And if he was a linebacker, I think this would be a different discussion. I think the fact that he plays defensive end, makes it so like complicated because he's really not necessarily a defensive end. He's the size and wears the number of a defensive end, but like, I don't really think he's necessarily a DN. If that makes sense. Yeah. Kind of like, like you said, Tyler Metcalf, like he's almost like not a linebacker. He's a special teamer. Right. Um, oh, is that what you mean? Like Daryl Johnson, almost a like, little bit a that. And, and even like, like at least like, like Matt does theoretically provide like some depth and can play a little bit of linebacker. Like, Daryl Johnson hasn't really played like linebacker snaps in the NFL or I mean DN snaps in the NFL since his rookie season when just by numbers he had to. So like I kind of mean like he's almost like not even really a defensive lineman. He's kind of just like positionless in a, in, a, in a sense. Yeah, I remember he just he flashed in the preseason. So it was like, OK, like we got to put this guy on the roster. But I don't know if people remember like his snap count got cut into throughout the season. I was like, OK, he's he can't really play on defense. Um but again, apparently he flashed on special teams and we need those guys. So, And then I guess the kind of the last guy I want to I want to run by you. And this is the guy I think is making this roster. And I it's seeming like he's sort of his chances of starting are sort of fleeing here. But we'll see how he does the preseason because, he, you know, he seems to be a gamer. But what do you kind of envision for Dane Jackson going into 2021? Because that's a guy that. You know, obviously in May and the spring, I mean, a lot of people were so like excited about a lot of hype about Dane Jackson and what he did as a rookie. And from what it seems like, it appears Levi Wallace is sort of pulling away there. But but I mean, what what do you think we're going to see out of Dane Jackson here going to this preseason? Um, so far, I mean, in, in practice, he hasn't had uh, some great um, coverage on him. Um, but I think at the very least, he is CB three. I agree. I um, again, I'm not a. I mean, I'm not a film guy. I'm not gonna pretend like I know what you know how to watch film. But as much as Dane Jackson did flash as a rookie, made the flashy plays at the pick against the Jets, had that great pass breakup when he was covering you know DeAndre Hopkins, which again can't be ignored. It's impressive from a seventh round rookie. Mm. Um, I know a lot of the film guys were saying that he did also give up kind of a lot of receptions and was sort of uh, like the inconsistencies that have been seen so far in training camp are kind of what we saw from Dane as a rookie. I, I still am intrigued and curious to see what he brings to the table, but I, I always thought that Levi Wallace has been judged, I think, unfairly harsh 
by Bills fans. Mm. I do agree that, you know, he's not great, but I think you can do so much worse at CB2 than Levi Wallace. And this is a guy that has played at a high level before. And I know he has, he's had some rough games. Everyone likes to talk about that Cleveland Browns game a couple of years ago when Jarvis Landry, you know, ate his lunch um, that afternoon. But I feel like for the most part, he's pretty solid and he doesn't really allow any big plays necessarily, which I feel like that's kind of all you can ask for with CB2. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my thoughts on uh, Levi Wallace summed up is I am absolutely fine if he is on this roster for his entire career. Like, I am okay with that. But we should always look to right. upgrade him if possible. At the very least, sure, keep him as a, like I said, CB3. Like, let's keep him on this roster for sure. But definitely don't pass up an opportunity to upgrade him. Let me ask you this too. So you, you mentioned, you asked me if I thought that... um you know, the bill, the bills, Brandon Bean sort of, you know, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, invest enough in D tackles, you know, in, in the interior defensive line. H- how do you feel about that with the cornerback too? Cause it's just cause that was, that was talked about obviously just endlessly during this off season and the bills really didn't do anything with that CV two. Like, do you think that was the right decision just to roll out Wallace and Jackson or were you sort of on the team of let's go try to find, you know, a, a real, you know, competition and someone who could be, you know, better than what we have. Um, you know, before we see any of these like new guys play, um, going back to back defensive end in the first two rounds and then back to back like tackles with like our third and fifth, I'd still be happy if one of those maybe went to a different position group. And then again, especially when we're talking about how crowded this defensive end room, it's like, I understand you don't want to pass up on a good player, but, um, like, come on, like there wasn't a good cornerback like available who like was in that like wheelhouse, like and suited like our needs to. Um, so yeah, a little bit. I mean, they tried it with Josh Norman last year that maybe that he could come in and shake, shake things up, and he didn't. Um this year to kind of just put all the baskets in or the, all the eggs in the Wallace or Dane Jackson, you're hoping. Like, like you said, we've seen Wallace play at a very high level, but he's been up and down. Um, Dane Jackson is a seventh round pick, which to me is like a glorified, like undrafted pick, you know, because you're almost there. So we're, we're just hoping it's like we're hoping that he is at as good or better than Dane Jackson. And it, again, he's a seventh round pick, like hopefully. But again, it's, it's just hope. Right. I. I would have liked them personally, I think, to to bring something in uh, at CV2 just to try the competition. I, It's been the one position that McDermott and Bean have never really put a lot of investment into. Mm-hmm. Yes, they signed Josh Norman to financially a pretty hefty number, but there were a lot of people who were who doubted that, that signing, who didn't think it was a good call. And they might have been right because yeah. I think Josh Norman really wasn't anything special at all uh, in, in 2020. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if they've neglected it necessarily. I mean, I, I think they kind of got lucky that Levi Wallace has turned out to be a very serviceable player. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, honestly, since EJ Gaines, I mean, I don't think they've really had a playmaker on that, you know, opposite Trey White. So, it's definitely uh, definitely interesting. But, yeah, it's like they just, they just keep settling. Right. If you ask me. Right, and and I kind of remember. I I think it was Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. I was listening to him once, and you know he, he was talking about CB two, and he was saying it, it's almost like Sean McDermott wants to make it hard on himself with like CB two, and like you know you can make life easier for yourself and get a guy who's got really good athletic traits who can do a lot of things that Wallace and Jackson and Norman and guys like that can't do physically. It's almost like he kind of wants like to make it kind of challenging and difficult, which is. Again, I mean, I, 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 if that's what they want to do and roll out, and like, what you know, what, what, what are you going to do about it? But it, yeah. it, it's definitely interesting how they haven't really pulled the trigger on putting a lot of resources into that cornerback, you know, two spot. Mm-hmm. Agree. All right. So before we kind of sign off here, Jeremy, I'm just curious. I do have one topic though before we. Oh, bring it up. Bring it up. No, I, I, okay. Go for it. Go for it. Let's do it. Um, Josh Allen got his extension and a question I've heard on some podcasts, some people saying like, 
like who's next like who's the next signing and there's a couple players i want to talk about okay sure. um so first somebody some people i've been hearing is well first off brandon being sean mcdermott it's like we got our left tackle we have our quarterback we have our cb1 we have our weak side linebacker if you want to like throw matt milano in there um it's like who's next somebody mentioned tremaine Edmonds, of course and and i kind of want to compare them you know with josh allen with josh i was like you know like if, if we sign him this offseason great i know he's on, it's only going to get more expensive but i don't think it's going to get that much more expensive if we just wait one more year and see if he can just play in the same realm as he did this past season um but they resigned i was like that's fine i'm, I'm totally okay with it uh with Edmonds, i want to say i absolutely want to wait until next off season for him and i'm, I'm curious how you feel about that i 100 percent agree i i think that Edmonds has been a good enough player we're picking up his fifth year option i thought was definitely a no-brainer i know some people weren't even so sure about that say what you want about the pro bowl the guy's been there two straight years has been the leading tackler on this team every season he's been on on the roster extending him though i agree because especially what we just saw i mean the linebacker market went up a lot this offseason with uh, Fred Warner and Darius Leonard signing their massive extensions that they got from the Niners and Colts. So I need to see more from Evans before I would be ready to p- pay this guy potentially a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's kind mm-hmm. of what the linebacker market's at right now is in that ninety-five hundred million dollar ballpark. Yeah. And for a team that's now paying their quarterback a quarter of a billion dollars, you 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 know, cap the money's tight. You gotta make sure that any extension of diving out to a player, you got to make sure that they're worth the money. And as of right now, I think you're better off waiting on Edmonds and just seeing what, how, if he can build off of what he's done so far in the league. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this year he's got to play better than he did his second year. Cause he was, he did much better second year and he was consistent. Um, to me, he's got to take another step up from that. If he plays just like that, like his second year, I guess some people might look at it as like a, a return to where he was, but I'm sorry. Like, is 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 it mean to look at that type of linebacker and say, "I'm sorry, like, I'm not paying you what the top linebackers are making. Um, you don't you don't play as well as them." So for him, it's like absolutely wait till next off season, and and he has to he has to take a leap for sure. Um, my second player that I have written down was Taron Johnson, and you know, Taron Johnson. From what I remember, he he uh you know flash as a rookie looked good but i think he had some injuries um second year i I think he had injuries again but was like pretty inconsistent uh this year you know everybody talks about the two pick sixes against pittsburgh and baltimore awesome but but don't act like i'm being blasphemous by saying uh he he got benched at the beginning of the year um so he has shown inconsistency and he has shown it every year even this year with those two pick sixes he got benched for an undrafted rookie our coach said let's try this instead and like i know he turned it around after that and i know sometimes that that has to happen but it's like i want somebody who's just going to go out there and be the best player they are and not have to wait to be benched after an entire stretch of games um and like i said it wasn't just like oh he got kind of picked on in this game and a little one's like no he had a stretch of games where he played poorly. So as a fourth round pick, I believe he is mm-hmm. in his contract year. And again, I'm worried that people are just thinking about those pick sixes and are like, give him, give him the contract now. Like, I'm sorry. I need to see him play like consistently like this entire season. No, I, I, I am with you hundred percent. Unless he comes out and plays as one of the top nickels. All right. In the NFL, I'm letting him walk. I, I'm not even considering re-signing him unless he literally has an all pro caliber season. Mm -hmm. I just think that you can find decent nickelbacks. I don't want to say easily, but it's not that hard. And keep in mind, like they drafted wild goose, right? Who's a guy that a lot of people think they're going to groom him up to be the next nickel. And Mm -hmm. I mean, on the depth chart, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm Saran Neal is currently right listed behind him, and that's a guy they have a lot of faith in, and they think that, the, you know, that's a guy that they could potentially groom into that big nickel role. Like, I just think that finding a nickel corner that is solid, it's not impossible. And 
I just think, like I mentioned, like you're paying your quarterback now top of the, I mean, we're talking about top dollar right now for Josh Allen. I mean, $43 million a year. Like, you don't have the cap space to give your nickel cornerback, right, a shit ton of money. Like, you just don't have the money for it. So I just mm-hmm. think that, I, I, unless he literally has an all-pro season, I don't see any way the Bills possibly extend him. Unless he yeah. comes back for, like a, like, a Levi Wallace like contract or something like that. Yeah, so based on what you just said, you know, that they're not super hard to find. I, I almost feel like, you know, treating that nickel cornerback like a running back, just draft one every four years. Yep, yep, no, 100%, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and then I guess, I mean, that is there any, you know, for me, because I'll, I'll kind of ask you this, because I think Saran Neal's also in a contract here, if I'm not mistaken. Like, okay. do you think the Bills re-sign him? Because I, I, I mean, I assume they do, just because he's such a important special teams player and such a good gunner, like, do you think that's a guy that they try to resign possibly? Um, I think he's a fascinating player, really, to, to, just in general, his whole everything about him. Yeah, I, like you said, I know he's a, a, a special teamer, but I, I just picture myself as one of the, like the guys from Office Space, just thinking like, what is it exactly that you do here? <laughs> and <laughs> but you answered it. He's he's a very good special teamer. And again, if you if McDermott wants to uh, keep signing really good special teamers, and he doesn't have to overpay him too much, like. Yeah, like get, get your special teamers that you know you need. Um, you know, but again, if you pay them too much, fans are going to look at it and be like, why? You know, right. Uh, just uh, I'm thinking, uh, like you said, you mentioned Matikevich and and I even think of um, does uh, AJ Klein play special teams? I think he does. I'm pretty sure he does okay. play some special teams. I might but be mistaken, even, though. But even his contract was annoying because it's like you're a strong side linebacker who's not going to play like that many snaps in McDermott's defense and like his contract. Uh, sometimes those contracts, they happen. They are what they are. But it, like you said, you can't make as many. We just signed our uh, franchise quarterback. We're looking to uh, pretty soon. Is it, you know, is it, is Dawkins still on his rookie? No, they extended Dawkins. Correct. Um, last off season. I think the next guy that they might have to really pay some money to is Diggs because he's under contract yeah. for a couple of years, but he's getting like criminally underpaid. I mean, I think he's, He's making only 14 million. 14, so they, 15. I think he maybe got an extra two this maybe, past right. season. Right. I think that's a guy they might have to like get, you know, eventually pay and, up a little bit too. And he's got to make 20 million easily, right? After this. I, I think, yeah, he I think he's going to be making like DeAndre Hopkins money sooner rather than later. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, pretty soon they got to be careful with those contracts. Again, we got like our uh, Trey White, Dawkins contracts kicking in, um, Matt Milano's and stuff. So they. <laughs> We all like to tell Brandon Bean as like this like contractual gangster. Like, you know, pretty soon he's gonna have to really start showing it, right? And I mean, we'll see because I I know the the uh, salary cap's about to explode. I think it's in twenty twenty three is when it's gonna like at me just start just multiplying. Um, I will say this though, just just real quick, just because I, I like that you brought up you know about how money is gonna get tight. I do still though have a lot of confidence in Brandon Bean just because I, I I've said this. I think his the most the best thing about it he does, not not his scouting and drafting necessarily. Like he has I don't want to say missed, but he's made a lot of picks that haven't maybe lived up to expectations, which yeah. I think a lot of fans sort of seem to kind of gloss over. Like I don't think he's the most amazing drafter ever. Mm-hmm. But he's been phenomenal at finding just such like free agent bargains. Every single year, just finding guys who are dirt cheap who come in and like play like way above the contract. So like I actually have a lot of faith that even when the money gets tight, like Brandon Bean will still be able to find like quality players and starters just because he's so good at finding these like guys that no one kind of wants and turning them into real, you know, good football players. Yeah. And I, I feel like I have to mention, you know, like our you know, we just went to AFC championships. If we continue like this team who's constantly like expect to go to the postseason, those contracts may not have to be as expensive as they usually are. Right. True. Buffalo will be more attractive in general. And, and yeah, there, that's certainly something to consider. Any other guys you want to um, go through? Or is that, that it? No, I kind of feel like those are the only guys who really have an extension coming up. I mean, Dawson mm-hmm. Knox still has this year and next year, regardless of, I think how he plays, he's going to be on this team for two more seasons. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I guess that's not. I guess that's basically it. All right. So I guess kind of real quick before we sort of wrap things up. Uh, going to this preseason game, I'm just curious. What What is the the one main thing you're really looking for on Friday night? Um. 
Well, I'm actually not going to be able to watch it Friday night. I'm going to have to watch like a replay on Saturday. <laughs> I have a work barbecue, and I, I was you. honestly thinking right now, I was like, should I just skip the barbecue? But <laughs> my wife would probably be like, you're going to skip a work barbecue for a preseason <laughs> bye. I was like, I like him. I'll wait. Right. Um, first off, I'm just I'm just happy that there's preseason in mm-hmm. general because I don't know what it was, but uh, you know, last year it, I didn't care too much, but like towards the end of the season. I started, I was kind of bummed that there wasn't one. I was like, there's so many guys that, you know, you didn't get to see play before it really mattered. Um, We don't, you don't have to think about players making the team just based on practice. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to actually just be able to see players play. Um, Even like from second string on. So guys that, uh, you know, you (laughs) expect to just play the most game. I'm, I'm just looking forward to see all these players play just because like i said we didn't get to see any of them we just had to go off of the 53 and what we heard about right. practice so um kind of a vague one i'm just excited to have that back this year no totally i i, I do definitely feel the same it, it, and i also kind of felt for some of these uh like bubble guys that you know the, pre- the preseason is there like that's what they bank on to show what they can do not just for you know the bills it's for the other 31 teams it's really a legal like, audition so yeah it'll be nice just to have just to see some football uh again i guess for me i mean the one thing in particular i'm gonna be looking at is the running backs i think i i know there's no moss we've been hearing so much about singletary who i'm a big singletary guy i definitely you know being someone who's who's a little short and small you know i always uh kind of have a you know lean towards and and kind of uh root for the little guys in football so i'm i'm really curious to see how singletary looks because i think that all the talk off season about oh they need to you know move on from him i thought it was a little you know, too extreme. I still think he's a good player. And mm-hmm. also Matt Breida. I mean, I, I'm really excited yeah. to see what how Brian Dable uses him because I'd like him to be a part of this offense. I don't want it to be like Yeldon where he's a healthy scratch every week. I want him to be involved just because he's got such a unique skill set compared to the rest of the running backs we have. So I think for me, that's really the area I'm going to be really looking at are, is the running back position. Um, I want to go back and actually – Mention some players now that okay. I have some time to think about it. Um, Isaiah Hodgins, I'm excited okay. to see him. Um, Spencer Brown, mm-hmm. I'd like to see him come in. Uh, Ryan Bates, they have him listed as center. I right because we've almost never seen him. He came in for like one series at center, mm-hmm. and then they put Felicia on there, and that was it. So we've kept him around this whole time because of his flexibility. I I am interested in seeing him play as well. And um, you mentioned Matt Burita, also a good one. And I feel like I had one more. Um, that might be it. So those three yeah. players, Ryan Bates, Def- Isaiah Hodgins, and uh, Spencer Brown. Definitely. I, I Yeah, lot, lot of, lots of watch these preseason games. Mm-hmm. So uh, before we sort of sign off here, Jeremy, is there anything you want to plug while you're here? Anything you're working on? Anything that uh, you, know, you want just people to follow you? Whatever, whatever you want. The, the floor is yours. Um, unfortunate news. I was, uh, co-hosting the Buffalo bootleg with my co-host Max. Uh, he unfortunately had to step back and focus on his, he has a senior year of college, had a lot of stuff going on. So he had to take a step back. And, um, but like you said, you had to do the, the podcast on your own the last week or two. I tried to do it once and I <laughs> made sure I never had to do it again. Um, I've thought if I could, I was like, can I do it again? But I just, I love like back and forth i can't just Mm -hmm. sit there and talk into a microphone so um so that podcast is kind of like on a maybe indefinite hiatus but uh i'm gonna try and and write a lot more i'm put my my satire and my my humor into some writing and maybe uh continue max's outrageous prediction pieces (laughs) and um maybe just like response to uh you know the game afterwards so and again right. totally not serious just 100 percent like absurd <laughs> that's that's what i do awesome yeah definitely you know check out anything jeremy writes so your stuff's always really good real funny so i always enjoy reading your your work jeremy thank you um absolutely and uh yeah again follow the show 585 report uh follow me and ryan on twitter i'm at mitchell underscore broder on twitter ryan's at sports rock too uh, and go check out everyone's work here on the Buffalo Fanatics Network. Everyone's working hard now that the season's sort of, you know, on the horizon. We're getting close. So a lot is going on. It's all real great work. Uh, we yeah. can stop just making up things to talk about. We're, we're right. I know. I know. It, it <laughs> is. I feel like people have no idea when it's like the dead of the off season and you got to like make content like it is so difficult because there's you feel like there's 
writing and talking about the same things just over and over again. So it, it is so yeah. nice to have real fresh stuff to talk about and, and bring to the table. It's just yeah. making every our podcast, lives a lot easier. Every podcast you listen to is talking about like the same one thing. Right, exactly. Like, yeah. And I can fi- finally come to that end. So yeah. Yep. Uh, so anyways, thank you so much for uh, listening to this episode. And we'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your day.